Blessings in Jesus, dear friends. This is James Jacob Prash, continuing our midweek Bible study from the book of Exodus. We're up to Exodus chapter 11 at present, and we'll be doing chapter 11, a short chapter, and the first section of chapter 12, the final of the judgments on Pharaoh. At the moment, I'm at the Moriel office for Europe, which is based in Holland, Netherlands, and I'm here for the first time. It's it's the new office, and that's one of the reasons I'm in Europe, apparently. But Gert, come and say hello. This is Gert. Gert is the Moriel administrator for Holland. Hi, God bless everyone. <laughs> Good. And so here we are at Moriel Europe, and wherever you are, thank you for joining us. A couple of brief announcements. The Moriel Conference in England, we had a great conference in Scotland with John Haller, but we're having a conference, an annual conference in England, the main one. That will be with myself, with Pastor Mark Jackson, and also with Pastor Tim Leach. Uh, two excellent speakers will be joining me, and uh, it'll be held in November. Uh, the details are on the Moriel website, moriel.org. Please try to attend if you can. It will be well worth it. We're living in a time of tremendous change and peril, and it's a time of uh, intense things happening in Britain. Um, even with the conservative government, things are very precarious politically, socially, and not least of all, economically. I'm in Europe at the moment, and things are in a turmoil. Here in Holland, the government fell, a bad government. I was just in Germany. They were in recession. It's a, a lot of things happening on this side of the Atlantic. And when things happen, in America, it affects the world. If things happen in Asia, particularly China, it affects the world. But if things happen in Europe and Britain, it affects the world. We live in a global economy and in a cyber world. One thing affects another. The ripple effects are global. And uh, the teaching that we'll be doing at our conference will be focusing on the position of the church and the ministry of the body of Christ in the present environment and the way things are unfolding, not just in Britain, but globally. But it will be particular emphasis on Britain and Europe. If you can join us uh, in England, it'll be in the English Midlands, uh, and it's on the website, circa the 27th of November. It is on the Moriel website, moriel.org. Uh, Beryl Hunter is taking bookings. We were... Um, considering what we should do, but I think the circumstances we find ourselves in are dictating what we're going to do. So that is it. Also, my upcoming visit to South Africa, that will be announced within a week to 10 days. It'll be coming up soon in, in August, but uh, the details should be announced in about a week as to the specific venues, venues and they'll be posted on the website. South Africa is a country, again, in serious, serious trouble. As we've been saying for some years, it is a country that has given up one evil for another. It has simply replaced one evil with another. Um, it is a dying country. It is a country committing suicide. Uh, now, that's true of other countries, but in South Africa, the pace is accelerated. Nonetheless, God has not abandoned his people who were there, and neither have we. And that's why I believe the Lord is having me to go there. We have a great branch there. We have some wonderful people. The work of Ebion is continuing among the, the children that with the youth ministry. And <clears throat> we have still a number of people on our mail list in South Africa uh, who we're in contact with. Of course, a lot of people have left South Africa, particularly white people have gone to Australia, the States, New Zealand, Britain. A lot have left, but a number still remain. And... Uh, we feel for them in their circumstances, and we're hoping by the grace of the Lord to be able to bring them encouragement and the kind of biblical exposition that will help them in their circumstances. Um, Mike Bonatti is working on it. Uh, Chris DeVette's working on it. We have a great team in South Africa, and we're looking forward to what God is going to be doing in August. Again, the venues will be announced shortly. The British-UK conference will is already on the Morio website please pay us a visit. Again, I'll be joined by Tim Leach, who has a great teaching. I've heard it, and it's fantastic. And uh, also Pastor Mark Jackson, who's also a wonderful pastor, wonderful mission director, but also a preacher in his own right. Please join us. Meanwhile, we're continuing with the book of Exodus, chapter 11.
Turn with me, please, to Exodus, Shemot chapter 11. Now, we looked at the darkness judgments, and we compared those to the patterns we see in the book of Revelation in our previous Bible study. But now we're beginning in chapter 11, the final plague, the final plague. Let's look at it. Now, the Lord said to Moses, one more plague I will bring on Pharaoh and on Egypt. After that, he will let you go from here. When he lets you go, he will surely drive you out from here completely. Speak now in the hearing of the people that each man ask from his neighbor and each woman from her neighbor for articles of silver and articles of gold. The Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Furthermore, the man Moses himself was greatly esteemed in the land of Egypt, both in the sight of Pharaoh's servants and in the sight of the people. Thus says the Lord about midnight, I'm going out into the midst of Egypt, and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die. From the firstborn of the Pharaoh who sits on his throne, even to the firstborn of the slave girl who is on back of the millstone. Now in Hebrew, it's two millstones. This was indicative of the lowest position a female slave would have had in Egypt on back of these two millstones grinding corn. It was the most menial, <clears throat> menial of tasks done by the lowest echelon of, of, of female slaves. And it goes on, uh, all the firstborn of the cattle as well. Moreover, there shall be a great cry in all the land of Egypt, such as there has not been before and has shall never be again. Now, again, when you see that term, never been before and never shall be again, automatically you should put a two for second coming in the margin. That is the language, obviously, of the Olivet Discourse. The Great Tribulation, nothing like this has ever happened before. Nothing like it will happen again. Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. Nothing before, nothing since. We see the same pattern again, again in Exodus. Something that was unique. And pointing ahead to what we see is coming at the close of the age in the book of Revelation. Nonetheless, let's go back. This judgment is coming, <clears throat> but in verse 7, against the sons of Israel, a dog will not even bark, whether man or beast, that you may understand how the Lord God makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel. All these your servants will come down to me and shall bow before me, saying, go out you and all the people who follow you. And after that, I will go out. And he went out from, from Pharaoh in hot anger. Then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh will not listen to you, so that my wonders will be multiplied in the land of Egypt. Moses and Aaron performed all these wonders before Pharaoh, yet the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he did not let the sons of Israel go out of his hand. We've highlighted this several times. Perhaps it's apropos to do it once more, as this is the final judgment. Go with me, please, to back to chapter 7 of Exodus. Back to chapter 7. In chapter 7, we see something. That when Pharaoh's magicians were able to counterfeit the miracles of Moses and Aaron, when they were able to do that, Pharaoh hardened his heart. He thought, Moses and Aaron can do it, so my priests, Jonathan Jambres, can do it. My God, Ra, is as powerful as your God, Yahweh. That was his thinking, and he hardened his own heart because his own magicians who the New Testament and Jewish literature identify as Jonas and Jambres, could mimic it, could counterfeit it. Now, again, we've spoken before. These uh, are types of the Antichrist and false prophet who are going to counterfeit the miracles of Jesus 
and his witnesses. But it's only when Pharaoh hardens his own heart that God actually hardens his heart in response in judgment, that God hardens his own heart in response in judgment. And that is what happens. In verse 11, Pharaoh called for the wise men and sorcerers, and they also, and the magicians of Egypt did the same thing with their secret arts. For each one threw down his staff and turned into serpent, but Aaron's staff swallowed their staffs. Yet Pharaoh's heart was hardened. He did not listen to them as the Lord had said. The judgments on Pharaoh were not arbitrary. They were in response to his own arrogance, even though God foreknew he would not listen. Now, the prediction of this final judgment is not introduced to us in chapter 11. We have to remember it was in chapter 4 that God told Moses that he was going to slay the firstborn. Chapter 4, God foretold it. Now, this is important. God foretold the judgment on the firstborn, the final judgment. But then all these other judgments happened. The, the frogs and the blood and, and, and the insects, the kinim, all these other judgments happened, but the final judgment was foretold. We have to understand the last days is the same thing. The ultimate judgment of Satan is foretold. The judgment of the Antichrist and false prophet are foretold. But all these other judgments happen before that happens. Yet the ultimate outcome has already been told to us by the Lord. When God let the children of Israel go through this, he told them what was coming. And he told them how it would end. We have to remember, keep your eye on the end. Not just what's happening now, but the omega, the termination point. Okay? Um, you have to keep your eyes on the end of the matter. When we are suffering, when we are going through trials, when Christians are going through tribulation, even persecution, as is happening in many countries, some of whom I visit. What keeps those believers going is the hope and promise and the return of Jesus. That is one of the things that keeps them going. They know the end. He will come. His judgment will come on the God of this world. Now, of course, I recall Richard Wormbrand being asked the question when he was being tortured for Christ. Uh, he wrote the book, Torture for Christ, in Romania under Ceausescu, which of the promises of Jesus kept you going? And he said, there reached a point where none of the promises of Jesus kept me going. Jesus kept me going. His personal relationship with the Lord sustained him. And that is ultimately true. Nonetheless, God declares the end from the beginning. With the Alpha, he gives us the Omega. Jesus is the end in the beginning. And we know what's going to happen at the end. We know how the war turns out. We know our victory is assured because the victory belongs to the Lord. We know we cannot possibly lose corporately. Now, a backslider who doesn't repent can lose. A backslidden Christian can lose. Somebody who falls away from the Lord can lose personally. But the church, even though it is going to be sent to the cross, believers will raise glorious and immortal like Christ did. The true body of Christ cannot possibly lose. The grave could not physically hold the physical body of Jesus, and the grave cannot hold the true church because it is his body. It may be persecuted. It will be. But in the end, the victory is assured. It's secure. All these other things are going to happen. But at the end, we know the judgment of Satan is coming. The judgment of the God of this world is coming. The judgment on Antichrist and false prophet is coming. It must 
happen. Now, the Antichrist will be in the character of Pharaoh in many respects. He's going to be arrogant. And he's going to be confident in his occult abilities, real occult abilities, incredible occult abilities. We're not talking about demonic power. We're talking about satanic power. And it's going to give him a false confidence, the way Pharaoh had. But ultimately, he's going to go the way of Pharaoh. Now, this is the last judgment, but God foretold the last judgment right from the beginning in Exodus chapter 4, if you recall. Now, let's look at this. One more plague. One more. Now, notice something. Although Pharaoh and his magicians and his court were arrogant and adamant and falsely confident, Although the leadership was like that, among the general populace of Egypt, the people were not like that. Many of the Egyptians knew Moses worshipped the true God. Many of the Egyptians esteemed and honored and respected Moses. They saw what was happening. It's amazing how people can see things, but the government just declares it's not happening, and the people are supposed to believe the government. Now, this has always gone on, and it goes on now, doesn't it? Um, the ruble has gone very low. <laughs> Russia is exporting about half the amount of oil and natural gas it did. No, oil, it, it not did. Less natural gas. And it's had to export it, what they are exporting, at a discount price to India and Russia. And they're not getting paid in rupees or in dollars and euros. They're getting paid in Indian rupees and Chinese won. It, 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 uh, Russia's economy is in trouble. The, the ruple is, has gone very, very low against the dollar and the euro. It's in trouble. Okay. Um, but... You listen to what the Kremlin puts out. <laughs> they just put out the party line. You're supposed to believe the party line, not what everybody sees. Now, the people can see this, but they're supposed to believe the party line. In the United States, the DNA evidence on the packets containing the cocaine in the White House were destroyed by the Secret Service. Everybody knows it's corrupt. Everybody knows the White House is corrupt and that, 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 that Biden's son is a drug addict and the agent of China apparently is paid by them and so forth. Everybody knows this. Everybody knows the corruption. But the mainstream media ignores it. You're supposed to believe only what the political leadership wants you to believe. That's true in Russia. It's true in Washington. And it was true in Pharaoh's court. It's always been like that. The people see. Eventually, they see. But when it comes to making a choice, it's something else. We see in the Exodus, when they came out of Egypt through the water, some Egyptians came with them. Some Egyptians came out with the Israelites. But most Egyptians, most, were able to see what was happening. They were able to see it. Now, let's look at this. What do we read? The Egyptians were showing favor to the Israelites. And when these things were happening, there was not even so much as a reason for a dog to bark among the Israelites. Dogs are easily excitable. Anything strange, unusual makes them bark. Notice the pristine common security that the people of God had during this judgment. This will happen. We will have the peace of Jesus when his judgments are poured out on the world we will have the peace of Jesus. Not peace as the world gives, 
but peace as he gives. Not a dog barked. Well, let's continue looking at this. The Egyptians knew. The judgment was coming. And ask from your neighbor articles of silver and articles of gold. We know that the Egyptians actually gave the Hebrews their wealth, their money. The meek shall inherit the earth. As we know from 1 Corinthians 10, the Exodus is a picture of the rapture and resurrection. We will get the wealth of the nations. It'll not be controlled by Soros or the, or, or the Rothschilds. It'll not be controlled by the Rockefellers. It'll not be controlled by Bill Gates. It'll not be controlled by, by Zuckerberg. It'll not be controlled by any of these people. It will be controlled by the Lord, and he will take it and give it to his people. The meek shall inherit the earth. During the millennial reign of Christ, the faithful believers who co-reign with Christ will be the aristocracy. Now we have a teaching on the book from the book of Ecclesiastes called The Divine Aristocracy, available on the Morio website. I would encourage you to listen to it if you have not done so. Um, I saw I saw <clears throat> princes walking and fools riding on horses. Well, right now the fools are riding in Cadillacs and the princes of God are walking. But it's not always going to be like that. There's a divine aristocracy. They shall inherit the earth. Now, what happens here in the Exodus is a picture of that. The wealth of the world will be given to the people of God by God. They will just forfeit it to the people of God. There will be a divine aristocracy. And if you're a faithful believer and follower of Jesus, you are a member of it. Think of yourself. Not that Christians should gamble. We shouldn't, of course, obviously. I'm simply making an analogy. Um, thou shalt not covet. I don't think Christians should buy, should gamble or buy lotto tickets or things like that. But imagine you had a winning lotto ticket. Now, what's interesting, I had a friend, I have a friend, haven't seen him in a while, in New Mexico. And somebody gave him a lottery ticket that was a winner for $20 million. And he believed the Lord showed him that if he collected that $20 million, it would cause him to backslide. I think he should have took the $20 million. That was pre-tax, of course. I think he should have took it and given it to charities and missions. But I honor the fact that he said the Lord told him not to take this money. It would cause him to get into the world and backslide. And he didn't He didn't cash the ticket and he tore it up. His name is Peter. True story. But think of yourself as somebody who has the winning ticket. You're a billionaire. You're a billionaire. You just haven't cashed the ticket in yet. When Jesus comes, the meek will inherit the earth. It is not worth trusting in this life and this world. The 80, 90, whatever, you know, even 100 years if you have that long, what's that compared to a 1,000 years reign with Christ and then eternity? It's nothing. It's nothing. It's a loser's game. The love of money is the root of all evil, but, but if you pursue money, if you chase it, you become, that becomes your main goal in life. You're a loser. Because even if you win, you gain the world, you lose your soul, you're a loser. On the other hand, you're a winner. Right now, you may be unemployed. You may be a single mother who got saved. You may be somebody who's struggling financially to take care of your family and yourself. You may be. But that is a temporary circumstance. You are incredibly wealthy. You are a son of the king. You are a member of the divine aristocracy. Jesus handed you a winning ticket when you gave your life to him. He took your sin, gave you his life, gave you his righteousness, and the meek shall inherit the earth. We are winners in Christ, not in this life or this world. The crooked money preachers are the same as the world. They corrupt the gospel to try to get Christians to trust in this life and this world and its temporary riches. 
where moth and rust consume. No, 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 no. The way the children of Israel got the wealth of Egypt, we will get the wealth of this fallen world. The rapture and resurrection, the millennial reign of Christ, it'll be ours. But what did they do with that wealth? Well, we know that in large part, at least, they used that wealth to build the holy ark and then to decorate the temple according to God's specifications architecturally. They used the wealth that God gave them from the Egyptians for God's purpose. And the same will be true for us. Again, the Exodus is a shadow of things to come. The history of things past is a shadow of things to come. We have to understand it in that context. But let's look. Okay. The judgment on the firstborn predicted in chapter 4 is now going to happen. Is now going to happen. Now pay attention. We are told something very, very interesting. We are told about midnight. I'm going into the midst. In English folklore, he's called the Grim Reaper. You can go to old cemeteries in England and see this skeleton with a hooded frock and a reaper, <laughs> a hoe for reaping, for cutting, harvest, and he's called the Grim Reaper. That's just a representation in English folklore of what in Hebrew is known as the Malki Mavit, the angel of death. The Lord sends the angel of death. But here it says something different. Although he makes his angel pass over, here we're told something else. It says, about midnight, I'm going into the midst of Egypt. About midnight, I'm going into the midst of Egypt. Now, in the book of Revelation, we see Christ coming, but we also see angels performing functions. We see angels performing functions. It's in the Oliver Discourse. Angels, he sends them to gather his elect and so forth. You have angelic function, but Jesus is at the center. That's what you see here. I am coming. Now, it doesn't say at midnight. It says around midnight. Around midnight. Now, in biblical times, it went by sunrise. Um, noon was the sixth hour. Because on the average, there'd been six hours of daylight, okay? Six hours of daylight, okay? 6 p.m., it would be dark. That's the 12th hour, okay? Midnight would be the middle of the night, halfway before the dawn. That's how they looked at it. You see this in the New Testament and so forth. He doesn't say at midnight. He says around midnight midnight. The night, again, as most of you know, is a metaphor in the New Testament particularly, but also in the Old Testament, for the period of darkness at the close of the age when the tribulation and so forth will happen. Watchman, watchman, how far is the night? Is he coming in the second watch of the night or the third? In both the Song of Solomon and in Matthew 25, the bridegroom comes in the night. Work while you have the light. Night comes, no man can work. He's coming like a thief in the night. Halfway through the night is midnight. Now, be careful of people who tell you that he's coming by their definition of mid-tribulationism, which is a mistake in itself, that he's coming at the three-and-a-half-year point of the final seven years of Daniel's 70th week, that he's coming at the mid... No, that's not true. That's not true. He comes between the sixth and seventh seal, but that is sometime shortly. How shortly? I'm not prepared to speculate, but sometime shortly, relatively shortly, after the halfway mark. After the halfway mark. 
The Lord comes in the second half of the three and a half years, but not long after the midpoint. Not long after the midpoint. We will not know the day or the hour. Do not speculate about dates and keep away from those who do. But we can know what time of the night he's coming. And at least in broad, approximate terms. And he will come just over halfway, sometime over halfway. We will not be here for the trumpet judgments, for the seventh seal. We will not be here for the trumpet judgments. We, we know that. Be careful of those who say he's coming at the three and a half year mark. That can't happen. And in fact, you can say, well, he made a treaty with Israel then and they try to count it out and they get the date he's coming. Keep away from that stuff. But he is coming after the halfway point and probably not very long after it. How long is another matter? I don't want to speculate. We don't know the day or the hour. But we do know that the Antichrist will break the covenant halfway through and set up an abomination of desolation. And Jesus made it clear, when you see that happening, when you see the abomination of desolation happening, fasten your seatbelt. Now, th that thing happens. He breaks the covenant and sets up the abomination halfway through. Fasten your seatbelt. Fasten your seatbelt, Jesus says. It, it, well, I'm, I'm not, I wouldn't even call it paraphrasing. When you see the abomination of desolation, that is one of the two things he told us to most look out for was the shikuts hameshomem, the abomination of desolation. Be on the alert. You won't know. Uh, be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known what time of the night the thief was coming, he would have been on the alert and would not have allowed his house to be broken into. He's coming like a thief in the night, okay? If you're on the alert, it's not going to take you by surprise. It'll take the others by surprise who are not alert, okay? Again, that's why Satan has raised up people like Rick Warren telling you to avoid end-time prophecy, telling you not to be alert. Jesus said to be alert, so Satan raises up people, deceivers in the church, telling you not to. And that's what you see. Now he's the chancellor of something of Spurgeon's Bible College in England. In any event, what does Jesus say? Therefore, in verse 15 of Matthew 24, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel, again, recapitulating what happened with Antiochus Epiphanes, let those who are in Judea flee and so forth, okay? Whoever's on the house must not go back down and so forth. He takes the events of 70 AD and tells what our response should be like, okay? Tells what our response should be like. We know that when this happens, his coming is getting very, very soon. That is what Jesus said to look for when you see the abomination standing where it should not be. Okay. Now, this has a spiritual meaning of Antichrist being worshipped within Christendom, Satan being worshipped in the church, but it has a literal meaning for Israel and the Jews in the tribulational temple, to the best of my understanding. Okay. The other identification. Uh, the, the mand mandatory identification factor for the Antichrist is, of course, understanding the, probably the gematria of 666, the name of the beast, and so forth. I'd point you to our book, Shadows of the Beast, but I digress. So we see this happening. Around midnight, something is going to happen. Halfway through the tribulation, halfway, not the tribulation, halfway through the 70th week of Daniel, rather. Forget I said tribulation. Halfway through the 70th week of Daniel, something is going to happen. 
And ultimately, that'll be associated, of course, with Antichrist betrayal of the Jews, the abomination of desolation, and so forth. But when that happens, the return of the Lord becomes more and more imminent. Okay? Now, this is a time of great tribulation, a time of great, great tribulation. Nonetheless, he's coming. Well, look at the pattern of Exodus. What we see in Exodus teaches us about what is going to come in the book of Revelation. Now, let's move on. Notice here that Moses, the Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and that Moses, Moses had become personally angered. Moses had become personally angered. Moses himself was greatly esteemed in the land of Egypt, both in the sight of Pharaoh's servants and in the sight of the people. It wasn't the people. It was their leaders. Unfortunately, given a choice, most Egyptians stayed loyal to Pharaoh. Not all. Most. Pharaoh will not listen. Now look what it says in verse Eight. All these your servants will come down to me and bow themselves before me, saying, Go out, you and all the people who follow you. And after that, I will go out. And he went out from Pharaoh in hot anger. In hot anger. There will be a burning anger. Anger by the people of God against Antichrist. A burning anger. Now, we're not allowed to hate people. But remember, at a certain point, Satan will inhabit the Antichrist. It will not be hating a person. Antichrist will be assassinated. The person will be dead. What is reanimated will be virtually an incarnation of Satan, or something very closely approximating it. It'll be hating the devil himself. It'll be hating the devil himself. Now let's look. Chapter 12, verse 1. Now the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, this month, that is the month of Nisan, or the month of Aviv, which means spring in Hebrew, this month shall be the beginning of months for you. It is to be the first month of the year for you. The rabbis, by rabbinic tradition, have changed the first month, Aviv, Nisan, into Tishrei, which is in the autumn, when Rosh Hashanah is. They call the Feast of Trumpets, Yom Tru'ah, whose actual meaning is warning of impending calamity. They turn it into Happy New Year. Again, this is the work of Satan. Instead of oi vavoy, woe upon woe, it becomes Happy New Year. In fact, in Scripture, in the Torah, what they call Rosh Hashanah now, Yom Tru'ah, the Feast of Trumpets, inaugurates Hayamim Hanoraim, translated into English as the days of awe, but in Hebrew, literally the terrible days. And this 10-day period between what is now called Rosh Hashanah, erroneously, and the Day of Atonement. Now, these things have a tremendously important future prophetic meaning as literal days. Remember, if you've read our book, No Bomb in Gilead, in his first coming, Jesus fulfilled the Passover, the Feast of First Fruits, and Pentecost, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, Hag Matzot, Hag Pesach, Hag Shavuot. He fulfilled these on the exact literal days in his first coming. Concerning his second coming for Israel and the Jews, this is after the rapture and resurrection now. 
he will fulfill his second coming on the exact literal days. Now, this does not concern the raptured believers. They'll be gone by now. It concerns Israel and the Jews and what's left of the so-called tribulation saints. It concerns them. But the return of Christ terrestrially, not in the rapture, he comes in the air. But when he returns terrestrially and his feet stand on the Mount of Olives, thou, those prophecies in Zechariah and Revelation will take place on the exact days. What Satan has done through the rabbis is give a different meaning to the, to the day that should mark the warning. Yom through Ah, the feast of the blowing of the trumpets, the shofarim, and so forth. He's changed the meaning, and they're saying, Happy New Year. This is designed to keep the Jewish people ultimately unprepared for what's going to come when they're deceived by Antichrist. It's amazing how he deceives Christians. It's amazing how he still is in the business of deceiving Israel and the Jews. But let's continue looking at this. Notice it is the first of Nisan that shall be the beginning of the year. The Jewish New Year is around the first of April, approximately the first of the month of Aviv or Nisan, two weeks before Passover. That is when the actual new year of Scripture was. But now let's look further. The rabbis change it. Now, this month shall be the beginning of months for you. It is the first month for you. Speak to the congregation of Israel. All the congregation saying, on the tenth of this month, they are each to take a lamb for themselves. According to their father's households, a lamb for each household. Now, Passover is on the 14th of Nisan. Notice the selection process of the lambs takes place four days before. This is important in understanding the Gospels. It is not our subject now, but on other teachings, such as our teaching on Amos 8 and 9, we address the issue, was Jesus crucified on a Thursday, on a Friday? How could he be three days and three nights, and so forth and so forth? Why were they eating the Passover ahead of Passover? Well, that is a big subject, and we do address it. And other Bible expositors have addressed it. Some addressed it, have addressed it well, and others not so well. Nonetheless, notice the selection process of the Lamb takes place before. Jesus was crucified, and they had to get his corpse off the cross for the Passover to take place. But the selection of the lamb took place before that. His trial, having no spot or blemish, one man without sin worth more than all the men with sin, but all men have sin, so God had to become a man. Only one. Not two, not Mary. Mary had sin. According to Mary, she had sin. She said she needed a Savior in the Magnificat. Only Jesus had no sin. Only him. He was God who became a man. Okay. All others have sinned. He's the lamb without blemish, but he had to be chosen before Passover. Okay. He had to be selected before Passover. And of course, there were multiple satyrs in the time of, of Jesus. There was not just the main one. There were other ones. And ultra-Orthodox Jews will continue satyrs into Hag Matzot even now, during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, they'll have many satyrs. But uh, again, <clears throat> this is another subject. I only mention it relative to what we're looking at now. The lamb had to be chosen ahead of Passover when it was slaughtered and then eaten. It goes on. 
according to their father's household, a lamb for each household. Remember, God is in the business of saving families. Um, that's not a guarantee every member of our family will be saved, but it is to say God wants them all to be saved. Now, if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his neighbor nearest to his house are to take one according to the number of persons in them, according to what each man should eat. You are to divide the lamb. Your lamb shall be an unblemished, unblemished male, a year old, and you may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Notice that. You shall keep it in until the 14th day, that's Passover, of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel is to kill it at twilight. Moreover, they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lentil of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the flesh that same night, roasted with fire, and they shall eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled at all with water, but rather roasted with fire, both its head, its legs, along with its entrails. You shall not leave any of it over until morning, but whatever is left of it until morning, you shall burn with fire. Now you shall eat it in the matter with, with your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover, for I will go through the land of Egypt on that day, and I will strike down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt, which is a figure of the world. Let's look. Notice it could be either a lamb or a goat. There were some obnoxious religious buffoons mocking a teaching that we did where I drew a distinction between the blood of the lamb and the blood of the goat. The blood of the lamb is, of course, what is emphasized in 1 Corinthians, the most paschal of the epistles. The blood of the goat is emphasized in the atonement, the day of atonement, Yom Kippur, in the epistle to the Hebrews. I'd point you to the teaching, uh, the life is in the blood. And they were mocking this because I believed in the blood of the goat. Notice here, right from the beginning, it was the lamb and the goat. Jesus is both the Paschal Lamb and the scape and, and, and the goat for the Lord on Yom Kippur. Not the sad as Azel, he's the other goat on Yom Kippur. The blood of the lamb and the blood of the goat. The Bible teaches that. These arrogant religious buffoons didn't even know what they were talking about. They just hate me so because they're into crazy doctrine and things. But I don't care about that. I care what the Bible says. Notice the Lord passes over us because of the blood of the lamb and the blood of the goat. Now, it's all the blood of Christ, but the blood of the lamb reflects certain aspects, and the blood of the goat reflects other aspects of the efficaciousness of his blood. The blood of the lamb and the blood of the goat. Why do we have two days when sin is atoned for? We have the Day of Atonement in the autumn, but we have Passover in the spring. Why two? Well, again, I'd point you to the teaching, the life is in the blood. But notice right from the beginning, there's the blood of the lamb and the blood of the goat together. There is both Passover and Yom Kippur, and we explain the reasons and the relationship between the two. On the teaching, um, the life is in the blood, available on the Moriel website, moriel.org. So they do this. 
Again, a lamb without blemish, Christ had no sin. And they could leave none of it left over. But notice, they had to eat it in haste. And they had to eat it with their sandals on, fully dressed and with a staff in their hand, ready to get out. Eat it quickly before you get out of here. Eat this. You need to eat this. You'll be safe if you eat this, but be ready to get out of here. When you're eating it, be ready to get out. Remember the Lord's Supper, according to 1 Corinthians, commemorates our salvation. And our salvation is prefigured by the Exodus. By the blood of the Lamb and the death of God's firstborn in our place. So God's firstborn could die for all of us. <laughs> Because he had no sin, no blemish. Be that as it may, let's look at it. Be ready to get out. We proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Remember, we're looking back and we're looking forward. Just like the Exodus and like the Passover today, Jews are looking back to the Exodus out of Egypt, but looking forward to the coming of the Messiah. So we look back to his first coming when he died for our sin and rose from the dead and his second coming at the rapture and resurrection. Turn with me, please, to Matthew 24, once again, the Olivet Discourse. Verse 45. Who then is the faithful and sensible servant? whom his master put in charge of his household, to give them their food at the proper time. Blessed is that servant, whom his master finds so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But if that evil servant says in his heart, my master is not coming for a long time and begins to beat his fellow servants and eat and drink with drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him and an hour he does not know and cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the uh, hypocrites. In that place, there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, how can somebody be God's faithful servant and become abusive to the sheep? And use or misuse his position and his knowledge for himself in a backslidden state. Well, whether or not this is speaking of one individual can be debated. I don't think it is simply one individual. I think it has special reference to various people, and it will in some degree relate at least to the two witnesses in Revelation chapter 11 at least some degree, relate to them. But it's talking about the people who Daniel tells us. Look with me to Daniel chapter 11, please. These will be people in the character of the Maccabees. And Daniel 11, verse 33, those who have understanding among the people will give understanding to the Many. And of course, they'll be victims and targets of persecution. Okay. Um, but we read that those who have insight in chapter 12, verse 3, will shine brightly like the brightness of the expanse. Those believers, those saved Christians, those followers of Jesus who have insight will feed others. They will give understanding to others. But knowledge is power, and power can corrupt. 
if we don't keep our eyes on Jesus and see ourselves as servants instead of overlords or masters. He's the master. We are servants. Those who have insight will give understanding to the many. A time is coming when there'll be a famine for the hearing of the word of God, as we've talked about many times. And in the last days, there's going to be a need to rapidly feed the sheep in preparation for departure. Deception is going to increase unbelievably. Backsliding and betrayal within the church is going to increase unbelievably. Unbelievably. You're going to see people you never would have thought betraying the truth. Betraying those who uphold the truth. You're going to see this. And it's going to get worse. It's already begun. But it's going to get worse. Um, when this happens, during a time of famine, the situation will be desperate. People will need to understand what Zechariah, Isaiah, certainly Ezekiel, Daniel, and Revelation, Zephaniah are talking about. They're going to need to understand it. But remember, in Daniel, these things are sealed up until the appropriate time. Once they're unsealed, once the food comes out of the oven, eat it quick. Now, at Moriel, we take this very, very seriously. We want to give people the proper food at the proper time by God's grace because the rescue, the rapture, the resurrection are coming. Deception and betrayal have multiplied and are multiplying. Just look at the state of the church. Just look at it. Open heretics. Open heretics. Stephen Furtick says he's God Almighty. Or the, Andy Stanley. Open heretics. Open false prophets like Mike Bickle. Gnostics, mystics like Bill Johnson. These have become the mainstream leaders of what the world considers to be evangelicism. You don't see any more people like uh, Dave Hunt or, 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 or David Wilkerson or Adrian Rogers, Martin Lloyd-Jones. Now, those men were not perfect, but they were godly and they taught the truth. You don't see people like David Parson around anymore, and he's not been gone that long. The leadership of the church has been hijacked by wicked men. Look at the Baptist Union. Just look at it. Look at the betrayal of the truth by the leadership of the Baptist Union. Unbelievable. People you would have once trusted, not just J.D. Greer, others. What has happened? How has this happened? It happened in Britain with the Baptist Union, with Douglas McBain and then Bernard Green when they signed up churches together in England with the Roman Church. I asked McBain, what would the Baptist fathers, what, what would John Bunyan have thought of this? What, what, what would Charles Spurgeon have thought of this? And he said, well, they disagreed with each other, didn't they? I said, not about the Roman Catholic Church and its false gospel. You want some quotes? He wouldn't deal with it. He wouldn't deal with it. Baptist Union, Baptist, Southern Baptists in America, we, we should become the number one spokesman for the rights of homosexuals and lesbians. Oh, my God. J.D. Greer. And, and, the, and the other people who went along with it and said, this is betrayal. This is betrayal. 
and this betrayal is going to get worse. We're all going to experience it. Leaders particularly. We had somebody who we had to get rid of in Moriel because he was a heretic. He is a heretic. He says, God the Father is not the creator. Among his other false teachings about praying God's power into a jacket. I'm not going to mention them. Most of you know what I'm talking about. We had two women who organized conferences for us in Scotland. Long-term friends. I was involved with their family. And, and they knew this guy was wrong. And they knew those who were promoting him were wrong for promoting somebody they knew to be a heretic. Yet they sided with those who were promoting a heretic and turned against me and Moriel and us. Well, this is, this is what Jesus said. Many will fall away and betray one another, even though they knew it was wrong. Look how many Baptists, they know this stuff is wrong. They know what's wrong. It doesn't matter. They fall away and betray. Well, it's going to be like that. It's going to be like that. It's going to get more and more desperate. People are just not going to know the truth anymore. They're not going to know true doctrine. It's rather disturbing that so many saved Christians can't explain why Jesus had to be crucified in our place. There's many people who are saved Christians couldn't explain that. Many. Why is abortion wrong? There are many Christians who can't, from the scriptures, they couldn't explain it. Many. There's certainly a famine for the hearing of the word of God. And many are falling away and betraying one another. Many. Well, those who have insight will give understanding to the others, but they will be targeted for persecution very often, and they will be betrayed very often, just like the Maccabees, and they are in danger of becoming corrupted by their own knowledge and power. The good and faithful servant didn't end so good or so faithful in one instance. In another instance, he did. We want to give people the knowledge to pass on. I don't like people to listen to Moriel Bible studies or just any good Bible study, be it Dave, David Pawson's older recordings still on the internet, which are which are good that people should listen to, or Martin Lloyd Jones that people should listen to. I don't want people to listen to that to be entertained or to become fat sheep. God wants people to get fed in order to feed others. That's certainly evangelism preaching the gospel but it is certainly giving understanding of the scriptures to other believers at a time when understanding of the scriptures is declining. Yes, this is the situation. When we look at Exodus 11 and 12, we see what happened, but we also see what is going to happen. These Bible studies eat it quickly. It's spiritual food, eat it quickly. But the reason we keep pointing ahead, not just to the past, but to the future, keep your sandals on and your coat on and your staff in hand. Have the keys ready. We need to be ready to leave. We are getting 
ready to leave. When these seals are unbroken and the understanding is given, when the mysteries of Revelation and Zechariah are made clearer and clearer to faithful Christians, while the backslidden church and the apostate church gets further and further from the Scripture, the faithful believers will get more and more illuminated by the Holy Spirit from the Scripture. Remember, that's apocalyptic. Unveiling. For the faithful believers, the curtain will go up. For the apostate church, for the backslidden, for those who fall away and betray one another, the curtain comes down. Well, that curtain is coming down for some, but it's going up for others. I hope you're blessed and edified by these Bible studies. Keep your shoes on. Keep your coat on. Be ready. We're not just having a tasty meal. We're having a meal for the road. The Lord Jesus is coming. We'll continue next week. Next week, I should be back in England. God bless. Thank you for listening. And greetings from those here at Moriel Europe in Holland. Hello, and thank you for watching Moriel TV. There are so many things that are happening at Moriel Ministries worldwide, from the Philippines to Japan, to India to Africa, and back to Europe and the United States. So many of our brothers and sisters are spreading the good news of Jesus Christ to this lost world. We are so thankful for your prayers. God has been faithful and has blessed us in so many ways. If you'd like to partner with our efforts abroad and at home, please take a moment to click the link in the description and help us as the Lord leads you. Thank you very much and God bless.